Okay, so today's the last day of uh, the last day of class. Um, a couple of announcements. Um, we're going. You should already have gotten notice about the fact that we're having the uh, review session, which will be next week. Um, the bunny papers. You should. We should have the grades posted before the exam, but we will definitely have all the papers available by the time of the exam, and we'll distribute the exam questions of the by email later on today. So you'll have plenty of time to work on the exam questions. And remember that the format for the exam is going to be exactly the same as the midterm. Um, so you should think about using the same kinds of techniques for studying and so forth that you used in the midterm. If you did well, and improving them if you didn't, but it'll be exactly the same. It'll be exactly the same format. Just more time to finish it. Yeah. There's, there's, it'll be the same format as before, which means there will be three, but you only have to do one. So yeah, so exactly the same. Yeah, it, you'll have a little extra time, so you can improve it, but, um, but I would suggest, as I said last time, I suggest using that time to say do an outline rather than just write more and more pages. Okay. Any other questions about So today what we're going to do is finish up talking a bit about uh, uh, gender roles and sexuality, and uh, Andrea is handing out the course evaluations. Please get one if you're coming in now. Maybe um, so we'll have some time to fill out the course evaluations, and please do that, and can we get a volunteer to take them back to the psychology uh, department? I don't think you can. It has to be somebody who's, um, who's one of the students. Thank you, Alice. Someone must be going back to the psychology department. Great. Okay. So yeah. So if you can hand those in, and then we can take them back to the psychology department at the end of the class. And finally, we're going to be having a special guest visiting today um, in the second half of the class uh, while you're filling out your course evaluations. Okay. As you're coming in, make sure that you get your course. Uh, make sure that you get the course evaluations. Oh, good. We actually have a pretty good turnout today. Good. Okay, so one of the what we were saying last time was that um, gender uh, identity is something that's already developing. Uh, gender identity is something that's already developing in the preschool years and throughout the school age period. But there seems to be this really striking uh, transition in about adolescence when gender identity becomes, for obvious reasons, more connected to sexuality and to sexual identity. And one of the things that seems to develop in adolescence is yeah, one of the things that seems to develop in is uh, a sense of sexual orientation. Um, uh, so of course, sexual orientation has to do with uh, yeah, course evaluation. Okay, single that. Um, has to do with erotic and sexual feelings for uh, either people of the opposite sex or people of the same sex or both, and it's an important component of adolescent identity. Um, now, it should be said there are some children who seem to um, have pieces, at least, of sexual orientation and sexual identity even in the school age period. So there are children who already feel uh, identification with other genders in the school age period. But in general, sexual orientation is something that often people um, discover in during adolescence. And one of the things that we know about same sex orientation is that it's actually, in many respects, uh, take that question, um, it, it's actually, um, in many respects, characteristic of primates. So one of the things that we've discovered is that, for example, uh, of course, evaluation. Oh, here, this is ridiculous. Maybe we'll just get everyone to get them later on when we're pulling them out. Um, one of the things that we've discovered, for example, is that bonobos, who are actually the primate species closest to us, the chimpanzees, extensively, sort of normatively, use same-sex sexual interactions as a way of uh, having affiliations between people, as a way of diffusing tension, as a way of making alliances. So these uh, animals treat sexual activity, as indeed many other animals do, not just as something that's necessary for reproduction, but as a behavior that can serve lots of other functions as well. Um, affiliation, pleasure, uh, other kinds of functions. So we actually have a strong evolutionary legacy that includes uh, same-sex behavior. And in, as, I mentioned, um, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that human beings have this much more distributed set of ways of investing in children, given our long helpless childhood, is also relevant to this issue of same-sex orientation. Because what it means is that sexual uh, bonds and alliances uh, throughout the animal kingdom are connected to having this investment in childhood, and uh, having investment in children who are the result of the sexual bond. Um, and again, among the novos, part of what seems to happen is that those affiliate, aff bonds of affiliation between uh, especially females having sex with other females are also connected to the fact that those females are helping to take care of the children. So one of the things that we know is that there's tremendous variance in sexual orientation. And I think somewhat for legitimate political reasons, there's a tendency out in the popular audience to think that there's sort of two categories. Either there are gay people or there are straight people, and they're biologically determined to be such, and gay people are always gay, straight people are always straight. But when you actually look at the data, what you see instead is something that looks much more like a continuum. So there do seem to be some people who have very strong, exclusive orientations towards one sex or another, but most people seem to be on a continuum, and a continuum that's very influenced by cultural expectations. So at various times and places across history, um, people have uh, treated the same sex activity as if it was just, say, a normative developmental process in British public schools in the beginning of the 20th century, for example, or on the island of lesbos for which lesbians are named. Um, it isn't just that there were gay people in those cultures and that they could be gay, but it was sort of assumed that people would be engaged in same sex as well as uh, different sex uh, sexual behaviors. So if you read Plato, for example, um, it's just sort of uh, taken for granted among those elite uh, 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 among those elite Greek philosophers, that they would have to be having sex with men and boys as well as with women. Um, so it depends a lot on cultural expectations. And another thing I think is very interesting from a developmental perspective is that you often, across history, see this kind of developmental fluidity where either culturally or non-culturally, you see developmental uh, variation and developmental change in how much people are involved in same-sex or opposite-sex orientation. So for example, as I mentioned, in uh, early 20th century elite, um, in the early 20th century elite English context, British context, it was sort of assumed that when you were an adolescent and a young man, you'd be involved in uh, same-sex sexual interaction. And then when you got older and you had a family, then you would sort of switch to heterosexual sexual orientations. Um, and in fact, Actually, there's some really interesting recent evidence which suggests that this kind of developmental fluidity continues, especially uh, especially for women. So a recent study that was uh, done in child development showed that there were a substantial number of women who were like me who thought of themselves as being exclusively heterosexual well into middle age, but then in middle age uh, fell in love with a woman and discovered that they actually were, well, of course, the question is, did they discover that they actually were bisexual isn't quite the right way of describing it. Changed or changed or expanded their sexual orientation in middle age. And that's actually a not uncommon uh, pattern for women. Um, and what we don't know is whether that extra fluidity for women, um, the kind of extra 
capacity for bisexuality, as it were, is something that is a biological difference between men and women in their same sex and opposite sex orientation, or whether it's reflected in what we talked about last time, which is that the cultural, the cultural pressures on males to conform to traditional male stereotypes are so much stronger than the pressure on women to conform to traditional stereotypes. So for the same reason that it's easier for a girl to be a tomboy than it is for uh, a boy to dress up as a girl, it may be that that's some of the same reason that it's easier for a woman to be bisexual, especially, say, a middle-aged woman to be bisexual, than it is for a middle-aged man to suddenly care what they were like. Um, again, what you see, it's kind of interesting, you see it in women more than in men. So you see cases in the opposite direction where you have women who've been exclusively uh, gay up until middle age and then change their minds and end up being married to a man. Um, uh, well, or not change their minds. I think usually when you do interviews with women, the way they describe their sexuality is just that they, it depends on the person instead of depending on their sexuality. So um, they'll kind of move back and forth depending on who the individual person is rather than depending on what their sex is. Which, that's the way that I would describe what my, that's certainly the way that I describe my experience. So I'm married to a man now, but it isn't because I stopped being bisexual and then went back to being heterosexual. It's just that he was a really nice guy who was actually one of the few men who was really as nice as most of the women that I know. So, um, uh, um, and you know, love putting flowers around the house and curling up and reading Jane Austen novels at night. So I think I think he basically has to be a lesbian anyway. So. <laughs> um, so on the other hand, having said that there's this validity in this continuum, it's also clear that there are people at either end of the spectrum. And I think if you think about it, it kind of makes sense thinking about what we said earlier about remember we talked when we talked about the relationship between heritability and the environment. Um, one of the things that happens is that when there are strong environmental constraints, then variation is likely to look more as if it's the result of, uh, of individual biological differences. So for example, to take the obvious example, if you have a very very strong biological same sex orientation in a culture in which there's a lot of pressure not to have that orientation, the people who are actually going to come out who are going to be visible are going to be the people who have the strongest biological same sex orientation, right? Because if you can kind of get away with not being gay, then in a culture in which there's a lot of pressure against being gay, you're more likely to choose the heterosexual option. Whereas very, very strong biological uh, uh, orientation towards being gay, then that orientation is going to be who you are in part of what happens no matter what the rest of the culture and the rest of the environment is saying. Uh, and it's a bit analogous to if you look at things like people who smoke, one of the interesting things that, uh, that's happened in a sense in the opposite direction of smoking is that when smoking was generally culturally accepted, uh, it turns out that when they did studies there wasn't very strong evidence for genetic basis for smoking. People smoking are mostly depending on whether they've actually taken up smoking. Now that there's much more pressure against smoking, when you actually look at smokers, it looks as if smoking is much more heritable. So it's as if what happens is the people who genetically have a very strong inclination to smoke or a strong inclination to get addicted to nicotine now are the only ones left who smoke. Because everybody else who stop smoking has stopped smoking the cultural influence. Um, so I want to emphasize, so I think it's important to emphasize that especially from a developmental uh, perspective, even though what typically happens is that you start seeing sexual identity in uh, the period of uh, puberty, um, there's actually much more variation and variability than I think the textbook or perhaps our common uh, identity would suggest. Um, and of course, as, I, as the interaction between biology and uh, as the interaction between biology and the environment would suggest, um, the numbers of, say, people identifying as gay early on in life have increased as the cultural pressures against being gay have been increasingly lifted. So that the estimates of uh, how many people identify themselves as being uh, gay or lesbian or bisexual range from sort of 2 to 4 percent, but those numbers have gone up as it's been easier and easier to uh, uh, both come out and to have more than one kind of sexual identity. Um, uh, nevertheless, it's still true that even though the cultural situation has changed substantially, um, there still are strong cultural pressures, especially in some parts of the country, against same-sex uh, uh, relationships. And that means that the process of coming out at puberty is a more difficult process for adolescents, uh, for gay adolescents than it is for uh, more standardly heterosexual adolescents. So discovering sexuality is hard no matter when you do it, but if you're gay or bisexual, it's particularly difficult and it's a particularly hard developmental, uh, uh, it's a particularly hard developmental milestone developmental threshold. Uh, okay, so gender has been explained, how can we explain, so we talked about some of the development of gender, what are some of the theories that can explain why it is that we see gender identity and gender development, including development of sexual orientation and sexual identity. And as it will be no surprise to anybody who's been sitting in the class since, uh, since January, um, it's likely that what's actually happening is that there's complex interaction of different biological, cognitive, and cultural kinds of factors. So the more biologically oriented researchers um, often describe what's going on in gender development in terms of evolutionary differences, uh, differences that might lead uh, girls and women to be more invested in childcare, for example, and boys to be more invested in uh, uh, aggression. Um, and then there are also approaches that look at the brain bases of different behaviors. Um, but it's important to, again, it's important to say from an evolutionary perspective that one of the things that's most distinctive about human beings from an evolutionary point of view is exactly the fact that we have this tremendous flexibility in our behavior. Um, and in fact, I just wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal, Lake Colton I wrote, which was about gay marriage. And I was arguing there that gay marriage and being gay in general was one of the most natural things that human beings ever did because one of the things that's most characteristic about us as human beings is that we change the way that we organize our behavior. And we evolve over time, over culture. One generation, each generation does things differently from the previous generation. Um, so when we talk about evolution, it's easy to act as if evolution tends to push towards nature rather than nurture explanations. But of course, the thing that's most distinctive about us from an evolutionary perspective is that we can overcome both cultural traditions and uh, our biological instincts. So that's really what our most distinctive evolutionary, that's really our most distinctive evolutionary uh, uh, accomplishment. So I sometimes joke that if you think that those are the two things that are most distinctively evolutionarily human, that we can overcome, override our initial biological inheritance, for one thing, and also that we can override and change our cultural traditions, on the other hand, both of which I think we have good arguments for. You could argue that actually being gay is the most natural form of sexuality, at least if you're thinking about human nature, or at least it's a highly humanly natural form of sexuality. Uh, okay. Uh, on the other hand, cognitive theories of gender development um, emphasize the way that children learn gender attitudes and behaviors through their experience. And a particular idea that's important, which I mentioned last time, is the idea that children construct gender schemas. So they figure out these kind of abstract ideas about what gender should be like and the very fact that there are genders, and then they use those gender schemas to them as being sort of intuitive theories of gender to try to understand and explain all the things they see going on around them. Uh, so we mentioned that there's evidence, for instance, that four- and five-year-olds are actually over gender differences. They're acting as if gender differences are more consistent than they actually are, and that's consistent with the idea that these children are developing gender, uh, gender schemas. Um, 
But gender isn't just like having a theory about gender isn't just like having a theory about uh, everything else, about the biological world or the psychological world. Having a theory about gender is important because it's also connected to your social identity. So what some theorists have argued is that it's not just that the children are overgeneralizing, this is what boys are like, this is what girls are like, but it's also very important for children to identify themselves as being a boy or being a girl. Um, so if you think about this kind of process of social identity, um, the, the, uh, this slide has a lot on it, but I'll just post, I'll post all the slides so you'll be able to read them. Don't worry about copying down everything that's on the slide. Um, one of the things that, remember, we learned when we were thinking about social development is that children start differentiating between in-groups and out-groups very early in development. So very, very early, they say, okay, these are people who are like me, and these other people are not like me, and I want to be like the other people who are like me. Um, and remember, we did those, talked about those experiments where even if you just put a red t-shirt on the child and say, okay, now decide, do you like red t-shirt people or blue t-shirt people? The child would say, no, I want to be like a red t-shirt people rather than blue t-shirt people. So if you think about gender from this perspective, we know that children will try to be like people who are like them even in a very arbitrary way, like having a uh, red t-shirt. Um, if you think about identifying as being a boy versus identifying as being a girl, that's a much more fundamental uh, and more pervasive division that we see in our society. So being part of the in-group, I'm a girl, so I want to be like other girls, and I want to uh, and I want to do the same kinds of things that other girls do. And not only that, but I want to differentiate myself from that other group that I'm not part of, the boy group. That uh, could be a kind of generalization of this general preference that children have for being part of the in-group rather than being an out-group, and vice versa. If I'm identifying my group is the group of boys, then I want to be more like boys, but also I want to differentiate myself from that other group out there, the group that are actually uh, the group that are actually boys. And one of the interesting things about this in-group out-group dynamic is that often it ends up exaggerating even relatively small differences. Uh, sorry, if you're an in-group, you end up exaggerating even relatively small differences between you and the out-group. Um, an example of this I always think of is if you look at graduate students talking about Stanford versus Berkeley, or even undergraduates talking about Stanford versus Berkeley. All of us, including me, are convinced that there are really these profound differences between the students at Stanford and the students at Berkeley. And the ones at Stanford all have long ponytails, and they have to come to Berkeley to get tattoos because you can't get a tattoo in Stanford. And uh, uh, so we tend to, and in Berkeley, we're free spirited and we're eccentric and we are diverse. And in Stanford, they're narrow and muddy grubbing. Um, and of course, if you actually did a study of the undergrads and graduates at Stanford and Berkeley and compared them to all the other undergrads and graduates in the country, they would have much more in common than they would actually have differences. They'd be smart, um, ambitious, uh, uh, likely to be successful, hardworking students. But when we're thinking about ourselves at Berkeley, one of the ways that we define who we are at Berkeley is by saying we're not like those other guys in the blue t-shirts over there at Stanford. So the guys in the blue t-shirts, they're really, really different from us. They don't have tattoos and piercings, and they uh, go to business school. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, one of the things that does happen exactly is that when you have in-group and out-group, this process of hyper-differentiating in-group and the out-group can have a consequence of increasing conflict and aggression, even if it's just mock conflict and aggression, like having a big game or the axe or something. So if you think about that in-group and out-group dynamic, you can see that given how pervasive our gender identities are, that could be a dynamic that takes even relatively small differences and then pushes, make really exaggerates. But it's also a dynamic that means that if I'm at Berkeley, then I'm going to push myself even more to, I don't know, wear beads and, uh, uh, and get tattoos uh, it, as a way of differentiating myself from the other people at the other side. Um, and there's suggestions that, um, that that might help to explain why gender typing tends to be more rigid for, um, for boys than for girls. Um, okay, so social cognitive theory suggests that learning about gender happens from many different ways, sometimes from sort of direct teaching, having someone tell you something about gender, as we'll see in a minute, looking at gender stereotypes in the media, um, also from the experience you have about how other people treat you. So one of the interesting controversies, for instance, about whether we should have same-sex or co-ed education is that there's some evidence that girls in same-sex schools actually end up doing better than girls in mixed-sex schools, in especially things like math and science, because they're not being reacted to as if they were girls. If you're in a same-sex school, everybody's just there, and some people are good at science, and some people are, are uh, good at humanities. It isn't that you're watching the way that other people are reacting to you as a result of your identity, uh, as a result of your identity as a girl. And another piece has to do with this modeling, actually observing other people, watching what other people are like, and again, identifying with, uh, with people who are of the same gender rather than identifying with people who are opposite gender. Um, and one of the important parts of that inactive experience, experiencing the reactions that behavior evokes in others, is a phenomenon that was uh, first identified um, by Claude Steele. It's getting old, it's terrible. Okay, Claude Steele is a friend someone I've talked to for hours. Uh, by Claude Steele at Stanford, actually. Um, uh, and he discovered that one of the things that happens is that because we're conscious of the way that we're being seen from outside, in terms of things like our gender identity, there's this phenomenon of stereotype threat, which means that people actually do worse, behave more stereotypically, when they're conscious of the fact that they're part of one group rather than another. So, for example, if you give boys and girls a math test, and the only difference is that at the beginning of the math test, you fill out, are you a boy or a girl, the girls do much worse when they just fill out at the top, uh, here's my name and I'm a girl. Um, and you see the same kind of uh, phenomenon with ethnic, uh, with ethnic identity. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is that you actually see it reversed. So you see white kids who are basketball players. If you start the basketball game by asking everybody to identify whether they're white or black, then they don't do as well at jump shots than if you don't start out by asking people to identify whether they're white or black. Um, so this is a very, very pervasive phenomenon, and you can see it all over. And again, what it suggests is that this relationship between what you think other people are going to be thinking about you. So if you're a girl and you're doing math test, you're sitting there and thinking, oh god, oh god, oh god, am I going to do well in this test or not? I'm a girl, maybe I'm not as good at math. Maybe when they're looking at it, they're not going to think as highly of me because I'm a girl. And then, of course, that means that you're thinking about that instead of actually doing a math problem. Yep. Stereotype graph. I should put it up on the slide. Just put it on the Actually, one of my favorite examples of one of the uh, stereotypes.